Skeptics and unbelievers love to claim that the Bible is full of contradictions. They can point out passages which actually do, in fact, say opposite things and give conflicting instructions. Why does one part of the Bible tell us not to eat pork and another says that we can eat any food we want? One verse says that collecting sticks on Saturday should be punishable by death, yet in another place we are told that every day is to be treated the same. Jesus taught on multiple occasions that we should sell everything we own, give it to the poor, leave our families and jobs and all of our possessions in order to follow him. Paul wrote that if we do not care for our families, then we are worse than unbelievers. Could God have really been that unaware of what he was revealing to people that he didn't even notice all those various commands that contradict one another? Are those contradictions evidence, as the skeptics say, that the Bible is really just a man-made document that is full of error and inconsistencies? We will see today that many of these so-called contradictions of the Bible are not actual contradictions, but are instructions given at specific points in history and given to a different group of people for a completely different purpose. So this is the fourth message in our series of lessons on the overview of the Bible. We have seen how the world was created perfect and good. The first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were created without sin and in perfect fellowship with their creator. However, Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating the fruit they were forbidden to have. That disobedience resulted in punishment for Adam and Eve and all of creation was put under a curse. Pain, injustice, suffering, and evil became regular and normal parts of life on earth. Furthermore, mankind became alienated and separated from God. God gave humanity a second chance by sparing Noah and his family in the flood. After mankind's continual disobedience, God called one man, Abraham, and promised that through his descendants would come the hope for reconciliation uh, for, for mankind and his creator. To Abraham, God promised that his descendants would possess the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Furthermore, God said that from Abraham's offspring would come a great nation, and that through one single descendant, all of mankind would be blessed. The revelation of the redemptive plan continued throughout the Old Testament. Abraham's descendants grew in number and ended up as slaves in Egypt. God miraculously delivered them by parting the Red Sea as they were running from the armies of the Egyptian pharaoh. When they were safely across the sea, they camped at the foot of a mountain in the desert known as Mount Sinai. There, God revealed a very important addition to the plan of redemption. He promised Israel that they would be a nation of priests and a holy people. Israel would be a channel of blessing through which the knowledge of God would be made known to the world. An important element of that special role was the unique and distinctive law that God gave to the nation. This set of 613 commandments provided moral and ethical guidance to show all the world the fundamental difference between right and wrong. The law also had hundreds of rules that were meant only for the nation of Israel. These laws and ordinances looked strange to many people at the time, and in today's world they seem completely absurd. Yet they served to set the Jews apart. It was how the world would know that these people were different because they had been chosen by the Lord, the God of creation, as his special people. They included strict dietary laws with very stringent guidelines about what food could and could not be eaten and how it was to be prepared. It told men that they could not shave the sides of their beards, that people could not make clothes from different fabrics, that mold in the home had to be cleaned in a very specific way. All these rules and regulations served to make Israel stand out from all the other people in the world and it drew attention to them and was meant to announce to mankind that there is a great and all-powerful God in heaven who has given this particular group of people these special rules. 
The law was a conditional covenant that God added to the unconditional covenant, the unconditional promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about the land, the great nation, and the blessing uh, for all people. When Israel was faithful to the law, they lived in peace. They were prosperous and they were blessed by the Lord. When they disobeyed the law, they were often oppressed, impoverished, and experienced national judgment. The law, the Jews became, came mistakenly, mistakenly to believe that by keeping the law, they could somehow merit God's favor and that if they were good enough, they could gain eternal life. This was not the case. Mankind was always and has always been saved by grace through faith, but keeping the law was still a central part of the life of the nation of Israel. The law also set a standard of righteousness that no one could meet. Therefore, the most important purpose of the law was to show every person on earth that they were sinners and needed a savior. The purpose of the law was to point people to the promised coming redeemer, Jesus Christ. The law pointed to the Savior through the various animal sacrifices the Israelites were required to perform whenever they sinned. The offerings had to be perfect, spotless animals with no flaws. The blood of the animal had to be spilled and offered to the Lord to show that the penalty for sin was death. Every time a Jewish priest offered the blood of an animal that gave its life for the sinning worshiper, it pointed to the true Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. As history continued, God revealed another important part of his plan to bring mankind back into fellowship with himself. The Lord promised Israel's second king, David, that an eternal kingdom would be established on earth, centered in Jerusalem. The ruler of that kingdom would be a direct descendant of David. At the same time, it would be the Lord himself who was ruling over the world. This would be accomplished by a promised deliverer, who would be Israel's king and who is known as the Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. The prophets that wrote between 700 B.C. and 400 B.C. made it clear that the message of that kingdom and the coming Messiah would be through the nation of Israel, and Israel would be the messenger of that gospel or good news about the kingdom. Now last week we learned from the gospels of how God brought about the centerpiece of his plan of redemption. He caused worldwide events to fall into place so that all of the prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Savior that would die as a substitute to pay the penalty for our sin could be fulfilled. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life and took upon himself the punishment that we all deserved. He died, was buried, and rose again to make us right and holy in the sight of a righteous God. During Jesus' ministry on earth, he never contradicted the scenario laid out in the Old Testament that Israel would be the channel through whom the entire world would be blessed. He made it clear that his teaching and ministry were directed at the nation of Israel. It was through their repentance and acceptance of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which would come to earth, that the Gentiles could come into relationship with God through Israel proclaiming this good news about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus died for the sins of the world, then he will bring in this great kingdom. After his death and his second coming, he will bring in this kingdom to earth and rule the nations with justice and righteousness. It was Israel's responsibility to tell that message to the world. At the end of the gospel records, Jesus had died, risen from the dead, and returned to heaven. His last instructions to his disciples was that they were to take the message of the kingdom of heaven and preach it to all people beginning with the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea. In the first chapter of Acts, chapters of Acts, we saw how the apostles started to fulfill that commission that they were given by the Lord. But they were not able to go beyond Jerusalem because Israel stubbornly refused to accept the message. After many months of preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem, God determined to judge Israel for their unbelief. In a scene recorded in Acts 7, one of the Jewish believers, Stephen, was stoned by an angry mob as he recounted all the ways that the nation in its history had rejected the prophets who had preached to them, and now they were rejecting the very Savior and Messiah who was sent to them by God the Father. This is exactly what Satan wanted. Since creation, the prince of darkness 
has tried to grab the souls of men and women and to bring them into a dark existence, eternally separated from God and in eternal judgment and suffering. The message was there to be proclaimed, but the designated messengers, the nation of Israel, the channel of God's blessing, the nation of priests, had failed to keep their part of the covenant. God had sent the Messiah, he provided the hope of eternal life, and he was prepared to return and establish the kingdom, but Israel would not believe, and therefore no one would hear of it. The world was now darker than at any time since the fall. Everything was there, it was all ready, but the people who were supposed to, to give that message to the world wouldn't believe it, wouldn't accept it, and so no one would hear it. And so they would still die in their sins because the messengers did not do their job. And then at just the time when the devil believed that he had won the battle in the souls for humanity, God did something totally unexpected in a completely unexpected way through someone who would be the last person that anyone would expect to become God's instrument. At the end of the message last week, I pointed out that in Acts 7, which describes the stoning of Stephen, there is mention of a young man named Saul. He was standing and watching this murderous event and seemed to be consenting with all that was going on as the members of the mob left their cloaks at his feet while they were throwing stones, stoning Stephen to death. We again read about Saul two chapters later in Acts chapter 9. How he had received permission to go after the believers, received permission from the high priests in Jerusalem to go after the believers in Jesus who had fled Jerusalem and ran to the Syrian city of Antioch. While he was on the road to that city, Saul saw a bright light in heaven and he fell to the ground. Then he saw Jesus from heaven asking him, why are you persecuting me? And I, that question always uh, just jumps out at me because he wasn't persecuting, literally persecuting Jesus. He was going after his followers. But Jesus recognized, you are, when, you, when you persecute my followers, when you persecute the people who believe and trust in me, you are persecuting me. And that's true today when we see the persecution that goes on uh, in the church around the world. They are persecuting Jesus Christ. So Jesus asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul fell to his knees and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, meanwhile, in the city of Antioch, where Saul was heading, the Lord spoke to a man named Ananias and told him to prepare to welcome Saul when he arrived. Now Ananias was shocked and afraid because he had heard about this fellow Saul and he knew that his only purpose in coming to Antioch was to capture the followers of Jesus and take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. The Lord then revealed to Ananias the special ministry that he had for Saul. And we read this. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul would become the primary spokesman for the gospel of Jesus Christ to all mankind. He was the one who would take that message to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the children of Israel. Saul would become known as Paul the Apostle and would be given a message to preach to the world the offer of eternal life to all who believe in Jesus Christ that he paid the penalty for sin. The great difference between what Paul was preaching and what the twelve apostles were preaching was that Paul said that eternal life was available to Gentiles without the need for, the, uh, for Israel to be the messenger or the channel through which the gospel was to be proclaimed. This was revolutionary and completely unexpected. Soon after Paul was converted, he went into the desert of Arabia for as many as three years. Presumably it was during this time that the Lord taught Paul the ministry that he was going to have. The Lord told Paul the fundamental elements of this completely new and previously unknown body of truth. Several years later, 
Paul was specifically set apart by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, and he and his companion Barnabas went throughout the Roman Empire telling Jews and Gentiles alike that simply by believing that Jesus Christ died to pay for their sins, that he was buried and rose again, they could have the hope of eternal life, they could have forgiven sins, and they could have reconciliation with God. What Paul was doing as he was traveling and preaching around to the Gentile world had no precedent anywhere in the scriptures. He was giving all the people the hope of a relationship with God with no need to submit to the Jewish ritual of circumcision, no need to follow the Jewish law or to observe the Jewish Sabbath or to travel to Jerusalem to observe the Jewish feasts. Yet Peter and the twelve apostles continued to proclaim all those things in addition to the message that God had come, uh, God had, uh, Jesus had come as the Messiah of Israel. So why was it that Paul was able to preach something so dramatically different? Paul explains what was going on with his ministry by using a word that unfortunately is misunderstood when it's translated into English. In the Greek language, Paul described what God had revealed to him about the message that he was preaching using the word musterion. The word is transliterated into English as mystery. However, when we think of the word mystery, we associate it with things that we we can't understand, they're beyond our comprehension. Uh, Like what we were talking about in Sunday school today, uh, how can God be everywhere at the same time? That's just a mystery for me, I can't understand it. But that is not the meaning of the Greek word musterion. The best translation for that word is secret. A secret is not necessarily something you can't understand, but rather it's just something that has never been told to you. When Paul uses that word to describe the specific message that God had revealed to him, he means that that it was something that had not been made known previously in the Old Testament scriptures. It had been a secret. What Paul was preaching to the world had up to that time been unknown. It had been a secret. It was not revealed to the prophets in the Old Testament. Jesus, while he would have known about it since he was omniscient, he did not teach it, however, during his earthly ministry. And the 12 apostles and the early followers of Jesus knew nothing about what Paul was going to preach. All of those messengers were working under the assumption that uh, of what they had known and what had been revealed in the Old Testament, specifically that God would continue to work through Israel, that they would be the chosen people, that the law would continue to be followed, and that Christ would return to establish a kingdom of righteousness in, re- in which Israel would be preeminent among the nations. However, what Paul was preaching and what God was doing after Israel had rejected Jesus, as seen by the stoning of Stephen, was something that was not really that hard to understand. It just was something that no one before Paul knew about. The first time that Paul chronologically uses the word, chronologically the first time that was, it's mentioned in his letters, um, chronologically, the first one time it's, it's mentioned when he uses it, is, uh, is when he writes to the Corinthians to tell why that message that he was preaching was kept secret. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When Paul refers to the rulers of this age, he's not talking about kings and governors and presidents. He means Satan and the fallen angels who work behind the scenes of the human rulers to promote his agenda of evil. Paul is saying that if God's plan to offer salvation freely to the Gentiles had been known to the satanic forces, they would have not tried so hard to have Jesus crucified. Satan would have worked to stop the crucifixion rather than to make it take place. Paul developed this idea of his message as a previously unrevealed secret all through his writings. In Romans 16, 25 through 26, Paul says this about what was revealed to him. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, which is a term no no one else uses that term but Paul, talking about the gospel as his personal 
possession, so to speak, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, or keep that word secret in mind, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to faith. Later, when writing to the Ephesians and Colossian churches, he states again the previously hidden nature of the truth revealed to him. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the secret, the, the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which you, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And then again in Colossians chapter 1, he says this, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In order to fully understand and appreciate our faith in Christ and the nature of the Christian life that we live today, it is absolutely necessary to realize that Jesus Christ revealed information to the Apostle Paul that had never been known previously to mankind. Therefore, what seems like contradictory instructions in the Bible are, in fact, new information given to the church which had not been revealed to Israel. God set Israel aside temporarily. He suspended the prophetic timeline in order to insert the current program called the Dispensation of Grace. The rules are much different because God is not now working directly through Israel as he had been in the prophetic program. The message of grace is to be preached directly to the Gentiles and, and it does not include obedience to the Old Testament Mosaic Law. That's why you can read commandments in the Old Testament to do certain things that we don't need to follow today. And even while, why Paul would say you don't need to do it, he would even contradict the need for doing those things because it's a new and a completely previously unknown body of truth. That the, the, the rules are different now that we are living in this new dispensation of grace. There are a number of very distinctive characteristics of this previously hidden truth and the current program in which God is working out his plan of redemption. And we're going to look at these now. So we've seen so far, this is our fourth week through this overview of the Bible. And the first week was all about uh, how we were separated from God, how mankind in general was, was isolated and alienated from God. In weeks two and three, that was completely about how God was working through his chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel. And that program gives a complete overview all the way until the end times. All, everything you need to know is in the Old Testament. What Jesus taught and what we have in the book of Revelation and some of the other um, Jewish writings of the New Testament just give a little bit more detail about what is already completely revealed, completely laid out in the Old Testament. And then suddenly, everything changes. It was because Israel was in unbelief, and God suspended that program with them because he loved the Gentiles so much, he wanted to make the offer available to us by grace through faith. And so, we look at some of the characteristics of this new distinct message that has now been revealed to the Apostle Paul for us. Perhaps the most prominent fact about this dispensation is that our relationship with God is based entirely by God's grace and is accessed through faith in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't believe that that truth is unique to this dispensation. Mankind has never been able to be saved by works. Even under the law, trying to earn God's favor through human effort was going to be futile. 
However, the connection between faith and works and these specific works of the law was so close that many people were confused and put their trust in what they did rather than in the power of God alone. And that relationship actually is so close, it was so, so intimate, that many Bible believers today, even dispensational Bible believers today, who understand the distinctive ministry given to Paul, will argue about whether or not believers in the Old Testament were saved by a combination of works and faith, or if they were saved by faith alone. So there's a lot of Bible teachers. You could go to a Bible conference of, of dispensational teachers, and they'll argue, oh, in the Old Testament, it was by, you know, they, had to, it was, they were saved by their works. And then others will say no. And then the others will say yes, and then the others will say no, and then it goes on and on and on. But anyway, you get the point. But that's because that, that relationship in the Old Testament was so close and so intimate that some people could not even see the distinction. If you had faith in God, there was no question you would seek to obey the law of God and you would do all of these things that were, that were outlined there. But I believe technically... Everyone was saved by grace through faith. They could not, there's no way that works, your, any work under any dispensation is going to be good enough to, to earn merit in God's sight. But anyway, now that we are under grace, it cannot be denied that for us today, the gift of eternal life is a gift. So, you know, when these Bible teachers argue about, yeah, in the Old Testament they were saved by works, uh, or their works were part of their salvation, that's just an academic discussion, really. It has no bearing on us today because it is unambiguous, it is clear, it is without doubt that today in this dispensation we have a relationship with God entirely by the grace of God through faith in what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. And there's no question about it. What happened in the Old Testament, as I said, that's academic. It's just something to, to um, keep you occupied and hopefully keep you out of trouble. But... Um, but our relationship with God is not based on our performance or on our ability to obey a certain set of rules today. And here are just a few of the verses that unambiguously prove that we are saved by grace through faith, that we are not accepted by God because of any works that we do. Romans 4, 5, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into his grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, but we might be justified, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, a verse that most of us are familiar with. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Titus 3, 4 through 7, which says... But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so we see that the, the, uh, the overwhelming, clear, characteristic of this dispensation of grace is the fact that we are saved by grace. It's not by our works. Now, I described salvation by grace through faith as the most prominent characteristic of the dispensation of grace, but I believe the most important fundamental truth is that God is creating a distinct and unique collection of his people. So the most prominent idea is that it's by grace through faith. But the most fundamental element of this new program is that God has, has created and is creating a group of his people set apart, distinct from Israel, set apart for his purpose and for his glory. It is a group of redeemed believers who come to God by faith in the gospel. All who believe with absolutely no distinction between anyone 
There is no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female, no slave, no freeman, no separate ethnic group or language. All are welcomed into this, this collection of God's people by grace through faith. Everyone comes to the Lord as helpless and lost sinners in need of that grace. And then we see this here. By which when you read, this is in Ephesians chapter 3, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been now, now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers in Christ through the gospel. Once a person places faith in Jesus Christ and in the gospel, the Holy Spirit performs a miraculous work of cleansing that pe person of their sin based on the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ, making that person holy in God's sight, giving that person new life, making that person a, a new creation, and placing that person into the collection of God's people known as the body of Christ. The church, the body of Christ, the collection of God's people for today did not replace Israel. It's not that, okay, we're just taking Israel's place. However, during the current dispensation, this is the group of his people through which he is working. Israel has not been replaced, but God has simply temporarily pressed the pause button, so to speak, on the prophetic program to give Gentiles the opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. The most distinctive characteristic of the body of Christ is that there is no difference between anyone. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Imagine that. That is some of the most revolutionary truth that is known to mankind. Our entire way of life, the fact of the matter is, you know, you, you think of, of the words of our own Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Those words are based on this truth. That when you talk about the, the Christian heritage or the Christian background of our nation, and I believe, you know, uh, we know that there, were, there was strong influence. There were a lot of that were not Christians, and there was a lot of unholy, unrighteous things that happened in history. But this basic fundamental truth that all men are created equal, that comes from the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And you know, surprisingly enough, it doesn't even come from the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he did make a distinction between Israel. Yes, God loved everyone. He has always loved everyone. But in his program, Israel had prominence. But when we read that there is no distinction, we are reading the truth that God revealed, the Holy Spirit revealed to us through the Apostle Paul. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink of one Spirit." Another important characteristic of the body of Christ is that the individual members are called to work together, each one having been given differing gifts so that collectively we can serve Jesus Christ and represent him on earth. For as, many, or for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then differing gifts according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. We have been placed into the body of Christ for a purpose, which is to serve the Lord and to honor him through our lives. The truth of the universal church, that it is made up of all people equally, is not a doctrine, but it is a reality. You know, we like to think of these doctrines and throw them around in our head. The body of Christ is not a doctrine. The body of Christ is a reality. This is the body of Christ. The world out there of believers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, that is the body of Christ. Those who are suffering in China or in Saudi Arabia under persecution, they are the body of Christ. It's not a doctrine. It's people. 
It's a reality, and we are a part of it, and we have a responsibility to the whole, and the whole has a responsibility to us. That's the amazing truth that we have about the body of Christ. Another important characteristic of the current dispensation of grace is that it has a distinctive beginning and end. End in the sense of in time, within, within the framework of time. God made promises to Israel that he said were everlasting. He promised them a kingdom on earth. They would, be the, they would be the messengers of that kingdom spreading its good news to all nations. The prophet Zechariah, speaking about the end times, says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The Lord clearly has a future plan for Israel, and it will include a definite distinction between Israel as the channel of God's blessing and the rest of mankind. It will mean a renewal of the Mosaic law. There will be a return to observing the seventh-day Sabbath and all that is associated with Israel as a unique people of God. God's future, as it is outlined in the prophets, and the teaching of Jesus in the book of Revelation is much different than what we are experiencing today. Israel, however, was set aside because of unbelief. However, that setting aside is not permanent. During our scripture reading this week, on Friday, you were asked to read Romans 9 to 11. Now that is a passage that most Christians rarely hear preached or taught about. You rarely hear anything about Romans 9 to 11. They'll talk a lot about Romans 8, and they'll talk a lot about Romans 12, both of them beautiful passages of Scripture. And then Romans 9 to 11, Bible teachers kind of uh, skip that over because they don't know what to do with it. And yet it is perhaps the most important single section of Scripture to teach about the place of Israel in God's program and what has taken place with the insertion of the dispensation of grace into that overall plan of redemption. Paul says that God will continue to make his grace freely available to all of mankind until a certain point which is called the fullness of the Gentiles. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Earlier in the chapter, Paul illustrated what was taking place by using the picture of two olive trees. There is the cultivated olive tree and its roots, which represent being connected to God through Jesus Christ. It was a condition which naturally belonged to Israel. However, because of unbelief, Israel was represented as olive, tree, olive branches that had been broken off, and wild branches are grafted in, the wild branches representing the Gentiles, who by nature were not automatically part of that tree, so to speak. Paul warns that just as the natural branches were bro broken off, so the wild branches can be broken off, removed, and replaced again with the natural branches. Now here I have a short video that describes what that means. And this goes into a, a, couple, a couple of disclaimers. One, it goes into some material we're going to talk about next week. Secondly, I don't agree 100% with everything he says, but the basic idea is correct. Paul explains this event in Romans 11 with the good and wild olive trees. As we cut into our scene with the olive trees, we can see that the good olive tree represents the circumcision, which are Israel, and the blessings associated with them. The wild olive tree represents the uncircumcision, commonly known as the Gentiles. When Jesus judges Israel in unbelief, the Lord broke most of them off of the good olive tree and only the remnant remains. Israel as a whole fell, were cast away, blinded, and became low am I, not my people. At this time, the prophecy of the 70 weeks stopped and will not resume until Israel becomes God's people again. God took the branches from the wild olive tree and grafted them into the good olive tree, representing that salvation is now offered to the uncircumcision, and he is joining Jew and Gentile together into the one new man. Back on our time chart, as we expand our time chart to scale and move our time marker into the future, we get to the end of the dispensation of grace and the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and the adoption takes place, commonly known as the rapture. The one new man is taken out of the way, and the blinders are lifted off the nation of Israel, and once again they will be God's people, 
and the time clock of the 70 weeks will begin again and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy will start, commonly known as the tribulation period. At this time the Gentiles will fall in unbelief and they will be broken off of the good olive tree and the natural branches, Israel, will be grafted back into their own good olive tree. Once again they will be God's people and no longer low am I. This allows the prophecy of the 70 weeks to start back up beginning the final seven years of the prophecy. Now the final thing I want to say about the special program of God in which salvation is made available unambiguously by grace through faith, when Jews and Gentiles come without distinction and we become members of God's people, the body of Christ, is how our time on earth will come to an end. The body of Christ is eternal. We will be with the Lord forever. But the time we have on this earth to make an impact is limited. One of the first things Paul wrote about in what is probably the first epistle in the New Testament that we have preserved for us has to do with how the dispensation of grace will end. The Old Testament, the teaching of Jesus and the apostles and the book of Revelation clearly, clearly teach that Jesus the Messiah will come to earth to establish his kingdom and rule from Zion or Jerusalem. This was all that the first Christians knew. These first believers, that's all they knew about the end times was what they had in the Old Testament. Therefore, there was a great deal of confusion about what to expect when it came to the Lord's return and the time that was going to take place immediately before that. One church in the northern part of Greece, in the city of Thessalonica, had to deal with people causing confusion about when Jesus was going to return. Keep in mind, all they would have known was what was revealed in the Old Testament. Paul then had to write to them, and as I said, this was probably the first letter that, uh, that Paul wrote that we have preserved for us in the New Testament. So the first issue that he had to address was, what about the coming of the Lord? And are we going through this tribulation? The Thessalonian believers were suffering persecution. And you can, if you read through uh, the letters of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it, it becomes very clear that they were dealing with persecution in that church. It was a local persecution, a local tribulation, but they didn't know that. And what they were thinking was, this must be the universal persecution that is talked about in the Old Testament. Because they were being locked up, they were being chased down, all these things that were, were taking place. And so... They must, and then they were, had others who were saying, well, you've died and you've missed the resurrection. And so they had all this confusion that was coming their way. So Paul wrote to the Thessalonians to clear up their confusion and to assure them that those who have already died or fallen asleep will be resurrected and those still alive will have their bodies transformed into glorified ones. All believers will be gathered and taken to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. We have this passage here. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, now keep in mind, they were, in, they were suffering persecution, tribulation. They thought they were going through this, this universal tribulation, and they may have thought, some thought that maybe they'd, that, uh, they'd miss the resurrection. So what does Paul say to them with this truth? Comfort one another with these words. Be comforted. Don't worry. God is going to take care of this. He's going to, he's going to take you out of this. And as we read in the next chapter, that he... He uh, assures them they are not appointed to see that time of wrath that's going to come. This gathering and catching away before the universal tribulation is often called the rapture of the church. The English word rapture is a transliteration of, the, of a Latin word that's used to translate the Greek word caught up. You see in verse 17 that word caught up. That's harpazo. Is that, am I right? Uh, Perry on that one, harpazo. Okay, if you translate that word into Latin, it's rapturo, and that's where we get the word rapture. So if somebody tells you rapture is not a biblical word, just tell them, go back two steps and 
go from the Latin to the Greek, and it is, in fact, a, a biblical word. Uh, because a lot of people who don't believe in the rapture will say that. It's not a biblical word. It is a biblical word, just in a different language. But anyway, so this event in which Jesus appears in the air without coming to earth, he raises the dead believers with, the, with resurrection bodies, he gathers the, 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 the living believers and takes them to heaven uh, and will bring a, then a close. This will bring a close to the dispensation of grace. After the rapture, God will resume the prophetic program with Israel, which will usher in then the end times as it's predicted in the Old Testament. So going back to our original question about the contradictions in the Bible, we see that many of those supposed discrepancies are answered by recognizing that we are living under a different set of rules than those that were given to Israel. Understanding these distinctions is vitally important to living a productive life that glorifies God. And I'm going to tell you, understanding the importance of grace, here in the dispensation of grace, in the revelation that's been given to, to Paul, it is unambiguous. Salvation by grace through faith alone. Um, my Sue's best friend, uh, her husband, is a devout Roman Catholic. I believe he is saved. I believe he is truly saved. But he is he's very devout in, his, in practicing his religion because he will articulate that Jesus Christ died for his sins. He recognizes that. But he is still under this ambiguous rule of, of uh, uh, system of, of rules and regulations, basically taking the concepts of the Old Testament and trying to apply them uh, as a member of the body of Christ. He is... Even as we speak, he is dying of pancreatic cancer. He is uncertain of his own salvation. And what's more is his wife will go to the Catholic Church with him, but will not um, go to confession. She doesn't go to the confession. And he is worried about her salvation because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that that is a mortal sin. If you take, conf if you take communion without confession, which is what she, she will take the communion in the church, she doesn't take the confession. She, uh, he believes that she will not go to heaven. So he is within weeks or months of death. And his soul is being burdened with, first of all, uncertainty about his own relationship with God and serious questions about whether or not his wife will ever see. She believes, you know, she, she believes fully and completely in Christ and his death. So there's no question, biblically, but this idea of mixing these, uh, these different programs, because what you've done, you're simply replacing one set of rules that were in the Old Testament with a different set of rules that somebody else made up. But the principle is still the same. I have to be good enough. I have to keep these, these rules, these obligations. I have to do this and this. And as a result, again, I believe, based on his personal testimony, that it's because of Christ that he will go to heaven or have the opportunity for heaven. I believe that he is saved, but he doesn't have that assurance. He doesn't have any sense of assurance of the reality of that. And that's because mixing these different concepts. And so if we try living under a set of rules and regulations, believing them necessary to please God, we will never be able to focus on those things that really bring him glory. And I'll tell you also, personal testimony, that if I did not understand, if I did not understand this distinction, I would live in, I would live in the same kind of fear. Because I would be looking back, if, if I didn't recognize what, um, what, what the scriptures teach, I would be the first one, like most of the church, to go back to the words of Jesus and say, well, he's the, he's the savior, it must be what he teaches has priority, what he taught while he was on earth must be for, for us because he's my savior, he's my lord, he's God. How could I give uh, whatever, whatever he said, well, Paul must not have been quite right or it's not exactly what he said. And I would be trying to live under those circumstances. I would, uh, I'd probably be out there homeless and without a job and not you know, deserting my family because that's what Jesus told me to do. And if Jesus told me to do it, I would do it. And I would, <laughs> you know, I would do it. And I would end up, be, end up with just this mass confusion, not knowing where, where to go. And so understanding these distinctions 
is, is absolutely important. And what we would end up doing is wasting our time with religious rituals and activities that have absolutely no bearing on our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're so busy trying to follow these rules and regulations that have been put there, how are you going to show compassion to the weak and the poor and the sick? How are you going to share the good news of Jesus Christ? How are you going to be able to do anything that gives glory to God when you're so busy trying to earn your own salvation? See, this is, this is the freedom that comes by understanding these distinctions. It gives you the freedom to be able now to serve God with, with complete liberty. You're able to just go out there. You know your relationship is secure. Now you have the power, the ability, the freedom to be able to serve him and glorify him. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, this is such important material and so unrecognized by so many people, even within the body of Christ, even within your people. This, this massive group of people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ don't understand fully the, the significance of your grace, what has been revealed. And we thank